Hello, and welcome to the Author's Den. When tragedy strikes, some people fall under the weight of their loss. But when 19-year-old Delbert McCoy suffered horrible burns in a fire set by arsonists at a teen disco, his family and friends fought every day to save his body and his spirit. During two and a half years in the hospital, through countless operations and painful treatments, Delbert was sustained by his innate optimism and gentle humor. His parents and friends rallied around him. After his discharge, Delbert returned the love he had received. He counseled burn victims and youth at risk, always sharing his sense of hope and his dedication to hard work. Well, Delbert, welcome to the Author's Den and congratulations on publishing your first book, The Fire in My Soul. Tell us a little bit about your early life. Basically grew up in a poor family. My father was a factory worker and he, you know, worked a factory to, to help support, take care of the family. <laughs> After we got a little bit older with the boys, we started helping out ourselves with paper routes. We shoveled snow, we did grass, the telephone books, all the, you know, all to try to keep the family, keep the food on the table and the mortgage paid. Then I, let's see, out the Northwestern, I graduated in 67. I was working two jobs in the factory at the one truck plant and Chevrolet gear and axle. At the one truck plant, I was a union representative. So I liked it. I was always, you know, people tell me I had leadership qualities. I was safety patrol. I was safety patrol of the, of the month a couple of times. Then I became lieutenant and then I became captain. So we got to go to a lot of sporting events. I went to baseball games. We went to hockey games. My favorite sports person was Gordy Hall with the hockey and on the baseball team was Al Kaline. Talk a little bit about your early life uh, before the accident. Back then you could get a job like it was nothing, you know. It wasn't like it is today. You could, well, matter of fact, I was working at the one that was the stamping plant before I got the two jobs with, the, with uh, General Motors and the in the truck plant. Well, how old were you when you had to start working full time? Uh, I was eight, 17 when I went in the factory. <laughs> but it was kind of kind of hard lifting them fenders all day, so I said, well, maybe I can get something a little, you know, less, you know, lifting that heavy fender. That was kind of heavy. So I got, that's when I went to the one truck plant and I got hired in the same day. So about two weeks later, I decided I got married. Well, let me get back to that. Okay, I got married at an early age. I was married at 17. I had two kids, two daughters. I guess that was about 18, 11 months apart. One's named Monique, the other one's name is Kim. So I was trying to make life better for them than what I had, so I knew I had to go to work to do that. My dad always told us that if you want anything out, out of life, you got to put something in it. So I say, well, this will be a good, I'm young, I should be able to work these two jobs and, you know, because it shifts, let's see, I worked the truck plant was midnights. And then when I got off that morning, I had about 30 minutes to go to the other plant, but it was right across the street, so about five minutes away. At that time in your life, did you have any idea what you wanted to do with the rest of your life? Did you have any career goals? I mean, growing up, I always wanted to be a lawyer or something like that. That's what I, that was my dream was. But by getting the family early, I knew that, you know, it would come later on in life if it came, yeah. Okay, now tell us about the incident that's described in your book. Well, my accident happened on January 12th. 1969. It was a dance hall. It was you could have no alcohol beverages in the dance hall. It was basically for meeting with you know your schoolmates, the older schoolmates that that you knew, or dancing, listening to the music, just you know having fun. A friend of mine had asked me would I meet him up there that night. It was a night that I did have off work. I had, I was working seven days, but this particular evening I was off that day. So I said, yeah, that sounds pretty good. So I 
I, we went to local 876. That was a couple of guys that I grew up with were singing there, so I wanted to watch them sing, hear them sing. So, and then when we left there, it was this this dance hall was. I think it was from 12 to 4. It was you know, so I went and as I got. I got out the car, a couple of girls took me down there, had them to drop me off down there. Even though it just shows you that destination is hard to get around. A lot of people was trying to get me to go, you know, somewhere else with them before we went down there. I told them, no, I told my friend I would meet him down there, so I was trying to, you know, meet up with what I said. As I got to the door of the dance hall, there was a couple of guys standing out in front. One guy said, I wouldn't go in there if I was you, you know, but I didn't see no indication that nothing was wrong, you heard, you, you, no fighting, no rottenness around it, so I thought, you know, just a guy saying something. So I opened the door, I went inside the vestibule. When you got inside the vestibule, it was about 20 stairs where you walked up the stairs. So I stood in line at the end of the line by me being the last one to come in. And about two minutes after I got in, the door opened. Somebody threw a, I didn't know it was gasoline, but it was a liquor, threw some liquor in, into a bottle. I believe it was a bottle because it splashed and it must have splashed up on me. Then seconds after that, a guy threw a match in and it was fire everywhere, you know, people were panicking. I tried to run up the stairs as I got to, I got about five or six stairs up. Someone pushed me down, so I was laying <coughs> into the fire. And something just kept saying, get up, get up. You know, m my thinking was, this is it, you know. There's no way this fire was all over me, you know, and I could feel it steady coming up my, from my legs all the way up my chest, my face. So I, so something just kept telling me, get up, get up. You, you got, you can't, you have no chance to land here. You got to at least try to get out of here. As I got to the top of the stairs, I got one foot up to the top and the stairs caved in. So if I would have stayed there a second longer, I wouldn't be here talking with you about this fairly. Were you ever able to figure out why this took place? What caused these people to uh, bomb the nightclub? Well, what I was told on later on was that these guys were, where well, they left, and I guess they went out drunk some alcohol, and then they tried to get back in, and they didn't want to spend another dollar to get in. So the security guard told them they had to leave, and this is why they did what they did. The two guys that did it were prosecuted. They were given a life without parole. They appealed it maybe five years later. A judge ruled gasoline wasn't an explosive, and they were, letting out, they were let out. One did six years, the other did eight years. Well, knowing this, how do you feel about that? Well, I'm disappointed because I feel that what they did was unnecessary, but you learn to live with it. You know, I, you can't, I can't, uh, relish on what they did. If I did, I wouldn't be able to, my mind would be steadily on that, and i try to think positive. You know, you can't leave the negativity behind. So what are your memories uh, immediately after the event? Can you talk about uh, your recovery process and the surgeries that you had? I was in the hospital almost three years before I came home. Okay, I was in Detroit General for a year. I was in a, there I was in intensive care, I think about six months. It was touch and go. My heart stopped beating three times. They, you know, uh, resuscitated me, brought me back. I remember one incident when my heart stopped beating. I didn't know at the time, but I was talking to my dad. He was there every day. He used to, I don't know how he did it really, but he would come down every day and sit with me and, talk to me, read the sports to me. That kind of, you know, gave me something else to think about. And one particular time I remember, I 
it seemed like I was just went into another world, like it was, I was sitting by a pond of water, and I had my feet in the water, I wasn't burnt no more. And it was, you know, I didn't want to come back. I didn't know at that time I had died, but it was, you know, it was hard to describe. It was, it was wonderful. I didn't want to come back. And this, I remember a cloud, image of a man from the sky, told me to get a watermelon and suck the juice out the watermelon. And when I was telling my dad about it, he told me, he said, you, you remember that? And he had told me, you know, you had died and they had to bring you back. By me working two plant jobs, I had two different types of insurance. Blue Cross only lasted for a year. So it collapsed at the end, at the end of that first year, stay in the hospital, and CHA picked up. That was more like a union insurance, but it was from the other plant. So it was, I remember leaving Detroit General. I then met a lot of nice people, the doctors, the nurses, and I didn't want to leave. You know, it was, it was like if I left there, I didn't feel I was going to survive because it was, you know, you make friends, they become part of your family, you know, they, especially the way they treated me, and, and I didn't want to leave, so I went to this metropolitan hospital, and it didn't have the facilities for taking care of burn patients like Detroit General had, but it, I never got the real catch in that hospital, it just like, instead of getting better, I was getting worse. I, one time I asked my mother, to ask the doctor how I was doing. But when she came back, she had tears in her eyes. You know, you could tell your, your mother, you know. And I said, what'd he say, Ma? She wouldn't tell me. Later on, I found out that the doctor had told her that he might be dead any, any, any time that infection had spread it all over my body. So my dad talked to that, the doctors at that hospital. He called the, Dr. Grifka back from Detroit General. and. Dr. Grifka made arrangements for me to be transferred to the University of Michigan Hospital in Ann Arbor. And that's where, you know, everything started getting better and better. And right there, Dr. Feller, Dr. Richards, they knew much more about burn patients than the other two hospitals. Uh, once again, what type of surgeries or procedures were involved in your recovery? What did you go through? First, they did a lot of skin grafts. They had to debride. Well, at first they debrided me. That means take off the dead skin. They they peeled off all the dead skin all over my body. Then they prepared me for skin grafts. They couldn't get skin from me, so they had to ask other people to volunteer skin. The first skin they got was from my brother and a friend of mine's. And that wasn't enough, so they had to. The same night that I got burnt, there was another guy in the hospital that had got shot. So some kind of way the doctor asked, asked his family if he wasn't going to make it, would it be all right if they used his skin for me? They call it cadaver, cadaver skin. So this, his parents got in touch with the hospital and told me it would be all right if their son, was, their son wasn't going to make it and he was going to put a plug. So any parts of his body that they could use for me would be all right. So that they used that skin to cover my body, which helped keep the fluids in so I could, you know, till my skin tissue started growing back. I mean, before that was, when they would put me in their whirlpool, the whirlpool was full of, it looked like blood, you know, it was just no, nothing to hold the skin, the fluids in my body. I had to have bone surgeries, they had to, Elbows, like my elbows are locked now, I can't move them. And then the fingers are fused together. But they gave me like a little pinch where I can pick up pencils and stuff like that. You know, I learned. And then you know, I learned myself how to do a lot of things too over the long period of time. You really are a survivor. You fought back against many odds. And now you're an author. Can you tell us a little bit about how the book came about? With the book, it was a guy. Timothy Sheard, he was in orderly, he was in nursing school when I was up in Ann Arbor. <clears throat> okay, how me and him got back together was, let's see, he was 
always a real nice guy when I was up in the hospital. He would come by even when his shift was over and spend time. He would sit around. We would talk about different medical things. We would talk about law. We would talk about all sorts of things. And I grew real fond to him. He grew fond to me. And anyway, uh, it must have been about 20 years later, he did an article in the Detroit Free Press magazine section called Albert and the Angels. My cousin called and she said, it's an article in the magazine section, sounds just like you. But, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe you pick it up and, and read it yourself and see what you think. I, my fiance Renee Brandon picked up a copy of the magazine section and I read it and I said, yeah, that does sound like me, but the name is Albert. I said, what I'll do is call the Free Press and ask them who was the author of this. They said, I'll tell you what, we'll call the author and have him to call you at your home. So they, they called and the guy called me. And when he, when he called, I said, he said, do you know what this is? But I could tell his voice. I said, it sounds like Tim, but I'm not sure. He said, yeah, I'm the author of that story. He said, I didn't know if you were still living or not, but I wanted to Get, it, get back in touch with you. You know, you, we were such, we were so close while we were in the hospital. So we got together and I asked him would he help me write the book. And that's how we came out with the book. What is the book really about? The book is about the surgeries. It's about my life. Well, it starts with my life before the, what happened. And then it goes off into the surgeries. It goes off into to stay in the hospital, the court, the court trial, the guys that did it. They actually had trial in the auditorium at, at the uh, Detroit General Hospital, and they brought me down to the, where the guys was. It was, that was kind of, you know, touchy there, because I didn't really want to see the guys that had done that to me, but I had to do it. And then it, tells about me how I went back to school and got my degree in marketing from Liberty University and how I helped a lot of kids and tried to guide them in the right direction. Now I know you work with children and young people. What's that like for you and uh, what are their reactions? Well what I do, my nephews, my nieces, their friends, any kid that I see might be, you know, need some guidance. I, I like doing that. I did it before the accident and I still do it. I like to try to tell them, you know, that life is pressure. You know, you just have to, you have to fight for what you want in life. And how you do that is you got to get a good education. That's the only way that, you know, you're going to be successful in life. You got you to gotta go out there and work hard to achieve it. What do you hope people get from the book? What do you hope they take away from it? What will they learn? I hope it inspires them. I hope it encourages them that no matter what obstacles get in our way, and that a lot of them, we run across a lot of roads in life, and I just hope they choose the right road to go down because, you know, it's difficult for kids today, even from the time I grew up. We did our factories and other jobs that depend on, that's not out here today. They have to go get an education and try to make the best, you know, it's, life is hard. Nobody said it was easy, but you can make it comfortable yourself. That's for each individual to do, and that's how I try to instill in them. You've been through so much with uh, your recovery process and all the surgeries. How has this helped you dealing with other people? Well, I just try to put myself in their shoes and I tell them that you know my life was hard but at the same time my life is good because I accept what my life is you know I look at it like this God puts nothing m more on you than you can bear you know that's the way I look at it and this is what carries me on uh, maybe this was something that God wanted God didn't do this to me, but maybe this is something that happened to me for me to teach other people. And this is the way I look at it. A lot of people say, how do you deal with it? How do you do this? How do you do that? 
you know, you can't, I can't run from it, so I gotta deal with it. Something we haven't talked about is uh, your religious upbringing or your faith. Were you brought up in a particular religion or faith, or did you go to a particular church, and has this uh, affected your recovery at all? We're raised in church, my father, Sunday school and church. We went every Sunday, and that kind of gave me the uplift. Plus, we had Bible study at the house, so my dad was and mother were strictly religion. They instilled that into all of us, that you get out of life what you put in it, you know. You must be angry that this happened to you. How do you deal with that? You know what? That's, I'd say the first few months I was wondering why. How could somebody do that, do something like that to a human, a human being? That kind of bothered me because, you know, you can't understand how people could be so cruel. It don't, I know this ain't the way God created the world. I, I just believe that, you know. But now you see so much of it. Back then it wasn't as revealing it as, as it is now. I mean, now you see all kind of stuff happening now. You know, it was, it was shocking and surprising, but I'm glad he gave me the, God gave me the strength to forgive and move on. Because if I didn't, if I kept that anger embedded in me, I don't think I'd be here talking to you today. If someone walked up to me and asked me, how did I move forward after what happened to me? Faith, courage, and accepting. That's what kept me going. That's what I would tell them. Well, when, when did the book first come out, and what are your plans for uh, promoting the book? The book came out in July of 2003. Okay, right now we have it on our website, which is www.thefireinmysoul.com. We have it in a couple of bookstores, which is Truth Bookstore in Northland and Black Star on Liver Noise. And we're trying to, as people go out and ask more about the book, we're trying to get into more bookstores. So that's what we, that's our aim, try to get into more bookstores. I sell it in different cities. I'll be out in front of different stores selling it. I get a lot of response. People like the book and they said they're glad that I wrote the story where they can share, where I shared it with them. It's a story that a lot of people probably would quit on life, you know, but I'm just telling people Life is precious. You never give up hope because there's always a chance as long as you got breath in your body. Thank you for joining us at the Author's Den. We hope you enjoyed our interview with Delbert McCoy, the author of The Fire in My Soul. I'm sure readers of his book will be strengthened by his story of courage, hope, and faith.